കരുണാർണവമായ കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം ബുദ്ധി അഹങ്കാരം പുലംബേതവും മദ്ദീതയം താൻ മറയവനും മാലും So what do we got today to look at? Well, we are continuing to look at uh, Murugana's Guru Vachakai Kolai and we are looking at it because it is a treasure house and it's a treasure house that to a large extent is not very well known even among ramana devotees yeah true and so it seems like it is worthwhile to open up the lid of the treasure box and see what's inside and we're on part 2 the practice of the truth and i wanted to spend some time on this part 2 because it is practice where we bring ourselves to the experience of uh, what ramana is talking about so it's not a matter of ideas but rather our own experience and practice leads to that experience so here it starts with uh talking about upasana worship upasana means worship that is clinging to god through body by doing puja through speech by doing japa or reciting stotras or through mind by doing dhyana and the first verse through the non dual knowledge advaita yana is difficult to attain excuse me though the non dual knowledge is difficult to attain it becomes easy to attain when true love bhakti for the feet of the lord shiva becomes intense since his grace the revealing light which dispels ignorance then begins to flow and so ramana talks from the very beginning of this about how love really makes this whole process flow Well yes because love means a spontaneous adoration of the good qualities of the beloved so for example in the case of shiva he has all good qualities he's detached he's intelligent he's meditative he's powerful beautiful attractive in every way so he's also fair and just and honest although sometimes he tricks the tricksters uh, uh in most cases he gives the straight truth and we can read his statements in the tantras or in the shiva purana and uh many other scriptures and he's always giving pointers for self realization this is his compassion mm-hmm. one of his most attractive qualities so of course shiva is simply a metaphor for brahman yes sir in other words this uh five headed uh form of blue color with the trishul the 
the three-pointed trident, but this isn't his real form. His real form is formless, mm -hmm. invisible, yes. imperceptible, yes. because he is consciousness itself, yes. or more properly, unconditioned awareness. Yes, and when you speak of this kind of spontaneous love, one of the things that uh, I experienced, the first time I went in to Ramana Maharshi's old hall where he taught for many years, that's the image that is behind me, uh, I didn't expect this but I just fell on the floor crying. And uh, it was, uh, of course, uh, just spontaneous and uh, unexpected, and it showed the kind of love that uh, I had. I really didn't know I had that love to that extent until I found myself on the floor. And but this course, is called uh, bhava. Uh-huh. And it, it means ecstatic symptoms of love. Uh-huh. And they have to be spontaneous because there was, it's like, like somebody is going to tell you, okay, now you're going to fall on the floor crying. Yes, yes. <laughs> And of it course, is written in the scripture. And of course, <laughs> at, uh, in the old hall, when I did that, uh, nobody noticed anything unusual. Because that atmosphere had been created there over a long period yes. of time. Yes. yes. Places have energies depending on what happened there. So in the case of Raman Ashramam, there are many locations that have very strong energies of devotion or meditation uh, or service. Uh, like he mentioned in the introduction to that chapter, the devotion can be expressed as uh, like japa through words, can be expressed by uh, puja, rituals of worship, where offerings are made, and many other ways. Yes. Body, mind, and words. Yes. By meditation and so on. Yes. And certainly uh, one of the things that I understand about this love is that for me, it feels like just love of the truth. It doesn't have to be personalized. It's this love of the truth. And to me, that's what uh, Ramana stands for. Yes, he becomes a symbol for it because of his realization. Yes, yes. So, you know, it's very ironic because the neo Advaitins claim to follow Ramana and they look down on things like puja and ecstatic devotion. Mm -hmm. Yet here we have Ramana explicitly encouraging it. Yes. And saying that these offerings of puja and such should be performed. Yes. Because they benefit, they don't benefit him if we worship him, or Shiva, if we worship Shiva, they worship, they benefit the worshiper. Yes, yes. Now also at Ramanashram, the next day, also very much to my surprise, when I went to the Samadhi of Lakshmi the cow, I found myself again on the ground crying. And I did not have any idea that I had that kind of connection to Lakshmi. Well, cows in general are wonderful. Uh, in Tiruvannamalai, on the shortcut 
that led from my house to uh, Yogi Ramsarat Kumar's ashram. Yes. There was one family that had a cow, and they bought her as a calf, mm -hmm. and they raised her. So I got to watch her grow over about a year, you know. And, and this cow would often be in states of meditation, completely, you know, looking inward uh -huh. and absorbed and, uh, you know, just in wonderful consciousness and radiating love. I mean, cows are wonderful. How anybody could kill them is beyond me. Uh -huh. And certainly the stories of Lakshmi coming to Ramana as a calf and jumping up and down in excitement like a dog when she saw Ramana. Uh, anyway, so I guess that's why there I was on the ground crying. Yeah, she must have been a very evolved soul to recognize him like that. Yes. And then to uh, express extreme devotion toward him, she would come and listen to his discourses every day. Yes, yes. Probably more carefully than some of the people. <laughs> okay. And she got the final liberation. Yes, yes. Now, the next verse says, by firmly fixing with love the feet of the Lord in the heart, one can sever the bondage of delusion. And by so cutting the bondage, one can behold the true light of supreme knowledge, one's heart lotus having blossomed. And Sadhu Aum says, that readers should here remember the teaching of Sri Bhagavan that self alone is denoted by the terms feet of God, grace, and so on. So to me, uh, it sounds like uh, Ramana is telling us real clearly uh, let your heart open. But yes, what because, you're opening uh, to is the self. The self, right. In other words, it should open on the inside. Yes. Not on the outside. Yes. Because there's a danger there that we can become attached to externals. Yes. Um, the self is within the heart. That's not the physical heart. Right. That's the transcendental heart, which is the source of all energies and consciousness and so on. Yes. And Ramana says that heart is on the right side of the body. Right. Correct. Yeah. He said and that's he uses, where you point when you say I. I was just going to bring that example up. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yes. And sometimes I uh, caution people when they read Ramana's writing about the heart that what they're talking about, Ramana talked about, is not anything physical. Because I have known people who uh, keep their attention locked to this uh, heart center on the right-hand side of their body, and that attention to the body consciousness keeps them from experiencing the depth of what is there. That's very interesting. Yeah, you, you have more experience than I do trying to teach this to people. And so you've seen some of the things that can go wrong, like people using who am I as a mantra. Yes. It becomes a literal thing, yes. whereas it's meant to be a metaphorical teaching. Yes. 
And that one, if this uh, go ahead. Sorry, if this self is bodiless, as he says in the first sutra of the uh, other thing that we're going through <laughs> verse by verse, <laughs> the vachana uh, some something or other. Um, then there is no physical manifestation of the self. The self is entirely virtual or consciousness-based. Yes. Sangraham. Yes, yes. Vachana right. Sangraham. That's right. Now, also, one of the things I would say about inquiry is that if you're doing inquiry out of habit, then it's still this mental thing. And somehow you have to do it where it is fresh and your experience is the experience of this moment, not engaging in some mental habit. So, Good point. you know, one of the things that I do in the uh, satsangs that I give over YouTube is each time I have a guided inquiry and every time I use different expressions because there are many ways that you can focus where what you're really doing is looking at the self. And so to keep it from being a habit, each time I use an approach to inquiry that I think relates to the verse that I was talking about. Interesting approach. They all work. You know, what you need is to have your attention deeper than the body onto what is always there. And you can get to it lots of ways. Yeah. And all those ways are but a reflection of the actual self. Yes, yes. That's really important. Like the body, for example, or the mind, seem to be conscious. But yes. that is not originating with them. It's a reflection of the self. Yes. They so borrow. even though this... Huh? Oh, I'm saying they uh, seem to borrow consciousness. From yeah, the self. yeah. The self illuminates them. Yes. And so they appear to be conscious, but they're actually just inert. They're machines, basically. Yes. yes. In order to ser sever the strong, long standing, and false bondage and be saved, Without wasting any time, meditate always with rousing and intense love on the golden lotus feet of the Lord. And Sadhu Om says, ever practice meditation upon self, Atma Dhyana, and achieve the supreme bliss of liberation says Sri Bhagavan in the concluding chapter of Vaichara Sangraham. Thus, we should understand that meditating upon self is what is recommended in this verse. Yeah, so the lotus feet of the Lord and other images like that are metaphors. Metaphors for the self. Yes. Yes, Even the word self is a metaphor, really. Yes. Well, how do you name because something the, that is nameless? Oh, the original problem. Yes, yes. <laughs> how do we talk about the inexplicable? Yes, it's the regular problem. All of this subject matter is like that. It's paradoxical. Yes, yes. That's why I love the Buddhist expression uh, about the moon and that the uh, teacher points to the moon and look at the moon. Don't get confused with that finger. Yeah. Just a pointer. It's just a pointer. Right. If anybody's ever done any computer programming, 
they know about pointers. <laughs> yes. And what happens if you confuse the pointer with the data it's pointing at? Uh oh. <laughs> yes. In the my very old days working for IBM, I was there when they invented pointers, when data started to get too big for it to be held on one disk of their early hard drives. And they had to invent these pointers. So it's the same with this teaching. Yes. The teaching is too big to fit in the mind. Yes. So it's represented by a symbol, a pointer, like yes. self yes. or Shiva or yes. lotus feet. And this is a carryover from the conventional bhakti uh, where one worships the Lord as having form. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all right, you know, that's a beginner stage. Yes. But then in the mature stage, one realizes, oh, wait a minute. If God or goddess, whichever you like, is everything and everywhere, that means she's also what I call myself. Yes. So my mind, my body, what to speak of externals like possessions and actions, but even thoughts are actually all God. So what is not God? <laughs> and in the beginning of practice, uh, when you start practice, you're, for most people, they're starting with the mind. And the mind wants to objectify things. That's how it works. So having uh, God as something you can objectify is natural. And... You know, part of the problem in practice is how can you use the mind to reach past the mind? And I think the answer is really you can't. You can teach the mind to get out of the way so that you can see what is there. But uh, the mind cannot know the self. So as much as you try, uh, you're not going to get there as long as you're thinking about it. There's a certain jump you have to make, a leap into the unknown beyond yes. the mind. Yes. Or as, as Krishnamurti would say, the unknowable yes. beyond the mind. But I would argue a little bit about calling it unknown because you know it all the time. You're just not don't know it cognitively. So is, right, it, is right. that known or unknown? That's a place where language has trouble. Yeah, we always reach the limits of language in these talks, don't yeah. we? That's <laughs> easy. <laughs> so uh, the unknowable is the self, because just like the eye cannot see itself, the self doesn't see itself. Yes. It sees objects. It sees the things outside. Yes. But this can be overcome by rejecting or ignoring the outside things and simply turning the uh, mm -hmm. self, the consciousness, on itself. Yes. Which in the non-dual state is perfectly possible. Yes. The true form, nature of God, self, cannot be understood except by the mind which stands firmly still in nishta, self-abidance or samadhi. Therefore, without allowing the mind either to wander as a vagabond that is, to undergo waking and dream, sakala, or to fall into laya, that is, to fall into sleep, kavala, due to tiredness, train the mind to be conscious and still 
on one target, self. And Sadhu Om says, it is indicated in this verse that making the mind still, that is, keeping it unaffected by Sakala, the state of meaningness, and Kevala, the state of nothingness, is what's called Nishta or Samadhi. Yeah, Nishta simply means standing in one place. Okay. Or being a being attached to one place. So nishta is when the mind becomes attached to the self. It's a higher stage. He's In the beginning, he was talking about spontaneous attraction to the self yes. and worshiping the self. But now we've reached the stage of nishta where there's attachment. The mind doesn't wander away from the self it has developed the habit of staying in the self. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this also gives rise to these ecstatic symptoms like bliss, even mystical powers. I mean, there are all kinds of various symptoms. Uh, it would take too long to list them. <laughs> but these are wonderful, and they indicate that we're making advancement because the mind is now resting in the self, doesn't have to be forced. Yes. And so due to the go ahead, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just have so much to say on this topic. <laughs> due to the attractive qualities of the self, the mind is all almost irresistibly attracted to it. Mm -hmm. Once the self is realized, even a little bit, well, there's no such thing as a little bit. Either you realize it or you don't. But when the um, vasanas, the habits that drag the mind away from the self, are purified by the various uh, practices that he mentioned earlier, like puja and meditation and so on, mantras and prayers, then the mind is naturally attracted to the self because the self is so attractive. Now, one of the things I appreciate that we're doing in these sessions is also talking about the kind of progression that occurs naturally. Because, again, this is not uh, information that is well known. And because of that, uh, people can get confused about what they are experiencing. And if you're confused, then the mind just gets all worked up and it starts getting in the way. And so helping uh, direct the mind in a kind of way where it doesn't get confused is one of the things that helps as you are deepening your practice. And so here uh, you've talked about here first uh, I start to notice the self and then after a while I can't help not notice the self and I think that's nishta that you're talking about there. You know, because after a while, how can you not see that the self is everywhere? And uh, abiding in everywhere is not a choice you can make because you're everywhere too. <laughs> well, that's the stage of realization. Oops. Yeah. When you reach that stage, then it, it's all downhill from there. Yes. <laughs> There's no more big efforts. Yes. The, the meditation really is to simply remove the obstacles. Yes. The distractions from the self. And before that, the stage of worship, puja, and mantra, and so on. Uh, are simply to build up pious credits, mm -hmm. punya, 
But one has to be in a very fortunate karmic position to advance into this stage of nishta. Yes, yes. It's not for everyone. Uh, because of the constant distractions and movements of the mind, mm -hmm. the chitta vrittis, as Patanjali calls it. Give up all attachments towards the petty sense objects Visaya, which are caused by the delusion, I am this fleshy body. The silent mind, thus stilled by renouncing sense objects, is the pure Mani Lingam, the superior form of Shiva Lingam. If this is adored, that is, if this mental silence is carefully preserved with the great love, which is the real worship of it, it will bestow unending bliss. Yeah, I want to mention that uh, re renunciation, so-called, cannot be done by force. If it is, what happens is there's a pushback from the mind Yes. It's like a spring, you know? If you compress a spring, it takes effort to keep it that way. And the second you let up, boing, it comes back to its original shape. Mm -hmm. So the mind is like that. Yes. Rotten. But when the mind has been purified, then it doesn't take any effort to keep it there. Yes, and Nomi described this as giving up what you like in favor of what you love. It's a wonderful expression. You know, that's uh, the problem with renunciation for most people is the idea sounds difficult. You know, it means I'm going to have to give up things that make me happy. And the answer is what you're going to do is to give into that which makes you the happiest. Yeah, and it's not an effort of will. Once you see the superior qualities of the self, yes. these other things just aren't interesting anymore. Yeah, it's natural. Yeah. So instead of it being... Uh, in the West, you would imagine that is the guy... Uh, doing austerities, wearing the hair shirt, and uh, all of those things. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that. Uh, certainly, hmm. the sadhus that I knew who lived around Arunachala, some of them, when you look into their eyes, uh, you do not see somebody who's there suffering. You see somebody who is there just in bliss. Yeah. There are people who forcibly renounce things. And one way you can tell them is that they're not in bliss. Uh -huh. In fact, they're deeply unhappy and frustrated. And they tend to project on others uh, blame and unhappiness. And, you know, of course. Uh, so these people didn't get it. <laughs> they, they didn't. They're still trying to reach God by force yes. instead of by love. So back to the Zendo. Really? It is very rare to get full faith in one God or Guru. If such a faith blossoms in the heart due to past merits, do protect and nourish it, since it is similar to a newborn baby, without spoiling it by giving room to any doubts or suspicions, just as if one possessed the common do one would bring it up with great care and love. 
and Sadhu Aum says the ka Kamalindu, excuse my terrible Sanskrit, <laughs> is a divine cow which will give one whatever one desires. Likewise, complete faith in God or Guru will bestow anything and everything upon a devotee. Such is the wonderful power of faith. Kama Denu. Okay. Kama means desire, and Denu means a cow. Okay. The wish fulfilling so cow. Yes, exactly. Whatever you want, for you can get from it. Uh huh. Including unlimited milk. <laughs> uh huh. Now, I think you were saying while you were in Tiruvannamalai, you knew a calf that was on his way to being that cow. Well, there are so many nice cows in Tiruvannamalai. My neighbor just to the north had several deshi cows, you know, the, the kind with the hump. Mm -hmm. Beautiful cows. And they, uh, he gave an enormous amount of milk. And I would go twice a week and take, you know, a liter or so of milk. And it was so nourishing and tasty. Yeah, it's not like the white cardboard that yes, <laughs> you get yes. in the store, you know? Yes. And um, the cows are known in the Vedas as being the source of religiosity. Ah, because everything that the cow produces, mm -hmm. milk, cream, butter, ghee, even the cow's stool and urine yes. is completely pure. Yes. And so it's used in sacrifices yes. in the temples. Yes. Uh, it, even the cow dung is used to clean the temples. Yes. And later on, the chemical te analysis shows it contains digestive enzymes that are so powerful that it completely destroys the cell walls of bacteria and viruses. Okay, okay. I did some tests on this, and I found that there's no pathogenic organisms that can survive in cow dung. Wow, wow. Yeah, and they're so, all benign. And certainly I would see in the houses of... Uh, these people I knew in the villages of Tiruvannamalai, the houses were dirt floors, and they would use the cow dung every morning and sweep their dirt floors with it. And I remember I went to a uh, ceremony that was the opening of a house that a friend of mine had had built, and at the end of the ceremony, we went from the interior house to the outside, and uh, it's like it was raining on us when we made that move, and that was the cow urine being sprinkled on us as we were going outside. They actually yeah. had to delay that ceremony to collect the cow urine that morning. But... Uh, you could tell that uh, they thought it was something important. We being well, it is. stupid Westerners were a little uh, taken back by having the cow piss on our head, but that's just because we didn't understand. It's medicine. Yes. It's used in Ayurvedic medicines. Yes, and it was a blessing. And as long as it doesn't touch the ground, it's completely pure. Okay, okay. See, this, the cow is one of the few animals that completely digests cellulose. Mm -hmm. Cellulose is the wall of the cells. Right, in the plants. In yes. plants and many other creatures. So if they can, you know, eat grass and digest it, they can digest anything. Mm -hmm. They have four stomachs. So, yeah, cows are very special. 
Now, the also, uh, when we were reading these verses, one of the things that I thought of is how, through these years, the kind of blessings that I felt personally, you know, to be have all of this stuff being brought to me somehow by uh, things like association with uh, Nomi and reading Ramana and looking inside and the fortuitous circumstances of my life that led me to this. You know, I have known for some time just how blessed I am and one of the th reasons why I have wanted to do things like uh, sadhu feedings and things like that was uh, as some way to try to return the blessings that I've received. We are all set up, Richard. <laughs> No, really. I mean, my whole family background and circumstances growing up and stuff that happened later that brought me to the path, it was all inevitable. It happened to me. I didn't do it. Uh huh. I can't take any credit for it. Uh huh. I also have the feeling that I can't take any credit for it. Somehow it was a gift from the universe. Yes. So, yeah, a it, it, normal person, <laughs> a sane person, will want to give that back, want to spread it around as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Just like someone who has a lot of wealth, their duty is to give in charity. That's a natural thing. Uh -huh. It's not natural to hoard it or keep it secret. Yes. You know, if you have the ability to use it for other people's benefit. Mm -hmm. And that also is why you and I are doing things like this. Exactly. So we have Ramana, as I had learned about Ramana and studied his writings for many years, I had much that I read about that was encouraging self-inquiry. And during that time, I didn't read verses like we have read today that talk about uh, the component of love of God, love of Ramana, love of the self, and how that powers and gives energy to the whole process. Even though I hadn't read about it, it was still building in my heart, as is evidenced by my reaction the first time I went into the old hall. And so it wasn't something that I was aware of, but it certainly was something that was there and had been there for a long time. I think from the first time I heard the words, I knew that there was something deep in these words of Ramana as expressed by Nomi. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that there was something that just kept drawing me back until I started to take it inside. And I think that was also the first touch of this love. You know, I love yes, the truth, the, even though I didn't know what it was. The guru echoes or mirrors the truth that is within us. And the, the better quality of the guru, the more purely they mirror yes. or echo that yes. inner truth. Yes. Yes. And what you say there makes me have even more respect for Nomi 
because as is evidenced in his name, uh, there was nothing personal about anything that he taught, and so all he was doing was mirroring the guru. And if he could have a talk where everything he said was what Ramana had said, and nothing was his own contribution, he would have been happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's his style. My style's a little different. Sure. And so is yours. I think to reach people today, we have to inject a little personal side, you know? Uh, yes. If we just repeat what's in the tradition without adding something to it to adjust for time right. and circumstances, the, uh, we may miss some opportunities. Right. Uh, because, you know, people want to hear something that's relevant to their experience. Yes, yes. And certainly, uh, while I say that about Nomi, he would, he would, in fact, start with things that are from Ramana and then continue with his own exposition. And what he was talking about always was from his own experience. And mm. so uh, I appreciated that deeply. He just did it with kind of impersonal love, and we're not used to that. We're used to everything being personal. And so some people couldn't recognize that for what it was. That's always a problem with these teachings because they transcend the personal level. Mm -hmm. So some people will perceive them as being kind of cold or distant, mm -hmm. abstract or you know, uh, not relating to their experience. But it's just because they haven't experienced that level of reality yet. Yes. And they don't realize how deep is the love that is being shown by the teacher. Yeah. Yeah, I have a friend whose mother just died. And... You know, I tried to get her interested in spiritual practices. I said, you know, everything in life is going to be taken away at death, mm -hmm. if not before. So the time to start spiritual practices is not when loss yes. or trouble hits. It's when we're in a good state of mind and we can then build up the insight that brings us through those difficult times. Yes, yes. But she just was not ready to grasp that. Mm -hmm. You know, she wasn't ready to engage in any kind of self-discipline. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So what can you do, you know? Right. You can offer, right? and then if they are attracted, if they hear that echo of something yes. that's in their hearts, you know, all well and good. But yes. if they don't, or if they choose to ignore it, there's not a whole lot we can do. Right. You except can open be patient. The door. You can open the door, but they have to walk through. Like some cats that I've known. <laughs> <laughs> Even they say, I want out. I want out. And you open the door, and then they just stand there. <laughs> But, you know, that's the thing. We have to respect the individual's determinism. Yes. Or else, well, what is this about? You know, uh, uh, compassion means that we accept people as and where they are. Yes. We don't try to uh, put something, you know, on top of them, add something to them. Add something to the burden they're already carrying. Indeed. You know, and, you know, these verses here say that uh, if you are serious about going deeper, whatever that means, you have to be willing to let your heart open. You know, love is the breaking down of the ego's wall. 
we want finally those walls to crumble forever. And so love mm. is certainly a part of the process and a part of the process that is, especially in the West, overlooked. And as you say, the well, neons yeah. ignore it altogether. Yeah, because to see the self or to be the self, those walls of separation have to disappear completely. Yes, sir. There are the things that create the ego by imagining that we're separate to begin with. Yes, yes. But they're also the cause of all of our suffering. Yes. So let's don't suffer anymore. Really? Okay. I don't want to be sad. I want to be happy. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. Anyway, so hopefully you can all be like we are, just two old guys here talking back and forth and smiling at each other. <laughs> We're having fun. That's right. The best fun. This is serious fun. Yes. <laughs> yes. Anyway, very good. Thank you for today. I uh, always uh, appreciate the words and deep understanding that you bring to these discussions. And so I uh, thank you for that uh, from the bottom of my heart. My heart thank doesn't, you, have Richard. A, doesn't have a bottom, and I still thank from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> no Namaste. bottom, no top. Namaste. <laughs>